to introduce today's uh, speaker is Professor Tom Mitchell from um, MISAS, Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies Department at Columbia University, um, the author of uh, Carbon Democracy, um, and before that, Colonizing Egypt, and many other articles that many of you, of you have read and edited books that you are familiar with. His presentation today is on capitalism as a mode of colonizing the future. Um, we circulated two very short readings and our expectation is that you will have done the readings. Um, <clears throat> and he will presume that you have done the readings in his, in his talk. And I assume that this talk is part of the new book that he's writing or is in some ways related to the new book he's writing. So we'll begin with Professor Mitchell and then we have, uh, we have two discussants. Tosin Orimolade will be the first discussant. Tosin is uh, just beginning his doctoral uh, research. Uh, so he's at Miser, he's finished his uh, MPhil and he's uh, finished his comprehensive exams. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the second discussant uh, will be uh, Teresa Aliu. Teresa is uh, in the fifth year at Miser and she's currently writing up her doctoral dissertation. Uh, both of them are political economy <clears throat> students um, and they will have between 10 and 12 minutes each. So my huge pleasure to welcome Professor Tim Mitchell. Thank you, Mahmoud. And thank you for this invitation to speak with everyone and to uh, discuss with you the work I've been doing, as Mahmoud mentioned, uh, uh, as parts of a, of a new book. Um, I actually have wonderful memories of my visit to Makarari. I think that was eight or 10 years ago, uh, something like that. And um, uh, it, it's, it's really a great pleasure and honor to be back speaking with you. Of course, I'm doing that in difficult times um, uh, around the world, um, but also for many of us very close to home, actually, as uh, uh, I, I was woken this morning, we have two very elderly neighbors, friends uh, in the adjoining apartment who are in their 80s and the, the coughing and the sickness from the apartment next door was a reminder early in the early hours of this morning um, how close uh, so many of us are to those who are suffering from, uh, from, from what has overtaken the world over the last few months. And I, it didn't seem to me that I could speak to you about the larger question of capitalism and how to think about capitalism other than in the context of these unfolding events of the last uh, few weeks. And of course, particularly as I'm talking to you about capitalism, from New York City, um, a hub of the global financial system, and so it likes to think a place that in some ways marks the very center of global capitalism. Um, but also the place, one of the places from where capitalism appears now very suddenly to have been shut down. Um, within just a few weeks, a single agent has brought about uh, the collapse of financial markets, it's forced economies to a standstill. Um, the novel coronavirus has created um, in the US and in other large industrial economies, the largest, the highest levels of unemployment since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Um, in fact, the numbers out of work um, are increasing so fast, certainly here in the US, that there is no way even of knowing their number or of counting them or representing them as statistics. In the US, GDP has fallen, the guess is, by about 30%, but again, nobody knows. Um, they do know that the financial crash that accompanied the arrival of the virus destroyed shares on Wall Street, destroyed shareholder value to the tune of eight trillion dollars. What makes capitalism so fragile? Where did that eight trillion come from and where has it gone? 
more broadly, doesn't capitalism depend to a certain level on preparedness, on, on being organized, on, uh, and, and even specifically on, on forecasting the future? Um, isn't it built out of a system of markets in which those with the most foresight are likely to succeed? Because that tends to be the kind of way we think about capitalism, the standard answer in moments of crisis is, is to blame government. Um, for government's lack of planning, for the slowness of its response and so on. And of course, there's a, a, a lot of truth to those failings. But I think the fragility we've seen um, over the last few weeks also uh, illustrates something about capitalism more generally. It's not that capitalism ignores the future, but nor does it exactly plan for it. Rather, what I'm going to uh, suggest and that I've tried to spell out in the two readings I've shared with you is the future is the place, especially today, that capitalism colonizes, the place it impoverishes, the place from which it extracts its profits. So it's got a very particular relationship to the future. Um, <clears throat> capitalism doesn't su suffer from a lack of foresight, but rather from a particular mode of not only valuing the future, but of consuming that future. Now, in thinking about that and writing about it, I've been uh, thinking a lot about um, <clears throat> the most obvious and in some ways, even in these times, the most alarming aspect of that relationship to the future, which is the, the climate crisis. Um, and I'd certainly be happy to come back and, and talk about that um, in the discussion. But I'm, I'm gonna talk today about novel coronavirus um, and, and connect it with the kinds of ideas that I put forward in those two papers. In New York, as in so many places, um, the, the, the coronavirus specifically in, in New York, um, but as in many places, there's a shortage of, of hospital beds, of face masks and other protective equipment, and of medical staff um, in, in those places. But of all, um, as I'm sure you know from, from the news media, there's been a shortage of one piece of equipment the artificial breathing device known as a mechanical ventilator, a machine developed in the 1950s in response to the polio epidemics of the decade before and after the First Second World War, put together initially using bicycle gears and um, car windscreen wiper motors. Um, the device gave rise to what had come to be known as intensive care units in which patients either too sick or too heavily sedated to breathe on their own, um, could now be kept alive. Why can't a place um, as wealthy um, and as prepared and as relatively well governed as the United States, despite the current regime, have enough of these machines um, to keep alive, uh, enough of these machines to keep alive those who simply need assistance to breathe? Um, <clears throat> the answer I think is, is, is quite straightforward and it's been covered in the press here and I'm gonna be drawing on, on, on some of that um, to make um, a couple of points um, because I think it, it, these points illustrate principles um, that are indeed at the heart of mad, modern capitalism. Some of them identified more than a century ago by the great German-American political economist Thorsten Veblen. Um, and those aspects have to do with the principles of, of rent, of monopoly rent, and of sabotage, of the deliberate form of corporate sabotage that is the mode of constructing those monopoly rents. Now from a quarter of a century ago, from the 1990s, um, in the US as elsewhere, there was a series of warnings about the possibility of highly pathogenic viruses and the pandemics that, um, that, that might follow from them. Um, there were the near misses of avian flu, of, of, of swine flu. Um, 
some of these, particularly those associated with the transmission of viruses from animals to um, humans, associated with the the spread of um, of industrial scale factory farming, um, particularly of poultry and pigs, and the particular way of concentrating animals together and of <coughs> raising animals in ways that um, uh, in, in in ways that produces enormous numbers of genetically similar animals um, in very, very close um, confinement and therefore more likely to spread a virus from one to the other. So there was a certain um, set of reasons why one had um, the arrival of these waves of epidemic um, viruses, avian flu, swine flu, and then of course um, SARS and MERS. And in the wake of that, as well as in some of the wake of some of the fears in the U.S. about um, uh, biological warfare um, uh, uh, at the time of 9-11 of, of, of and then the attack on Iraq, um, the U.S. government identified a need to create a large stockpile of ventilators to deal with the possibility of such a pandemic. The critical thing was it wanted something cheap. Um, a ventilator that could be had for say a couple of thousand dollars and that was not only cheap but portable and simple to use. Um, it's not just in order to keep the cost down but because the ventilators typically found in hospital intensive care units not only cost four times the price of such a cheap unit but they're vastly more complex and require therefore a team of trained personnel to install them, to monitor them, um, connect them to the nurse's station uh, through computer systems and so on. The, the operating manual for a, a typical model, which I read yesterday, the, the Newport HT70, is almost 200 pages long. Um, in a pandemic, there's a shortage of the machines, but equally, there's a shortage of the technicians to run them. So it's a situation where um, simplicity is not just a cost saving measure, but it's also critical to the, um, the, the very uh, ability to use um, the device. So the US wanted to create a stockpile of ventilators and in 2010, after money had been appropriated by the US Congress, the government awarded a $6 million contract to a sport, small firm in California, a specialist maker of ventilators called Newport Medical Instruments. It had been founded by some entrepreneurial physicians, medical doctors in California, and um, beat out much larger firms in the contract to produce um, a prototype for a simple machine. Um, and the government um, developed plans to, uh, to purchase 40,000 of these machines. The prototype was developed by Newport, it was approved um, by the government, by the Food and Drug Administration, and it was about to go into production in 2012 when, out of the blue, a much larger firm by the name of Covidian bought up Newport. This story has been recently reported in the New York Times and elsewhere. Um, Covidian today, the main name may not be familiar, and that's because it itself, um, a couple of years later, was bought up by another firm, an even larger one, Medtronic, which is the world's largest man manufacturer of medical devices and also makes pacemakers, uh, as, besides its own uh, more complex ventilators, dialysis, dialysis machines, and various other uh, mechanical versions of vital human organs. Um, the new corporate owners, um, having bought up the small California firm, stopped work on the government ventilator project. And then, um, even though the money had been for it had been appropriated by Congress, uh, allowed the project to first go on a back burner and then to die. The New York Times interviewed some of the key participants in that project. And those people suggested that the larger firm's motive for buying the small firm was precisely to destroy the cheap device in order to protect the sales of its own much more expensive machine. Those sales, um, while perhaps not threatened by the government creating a stockpile, would be threatened by a commercial version of that cheap and portable machine. And uh, for that reason, it was alleged. Um, the executives of the larger company decided 
um, to halt the production of the ventilators. So the government had spent millions of dollars at that point and not a single ventilator for the stockpile had been produced. So then the government turned, um, uh, renegotiated the deal or, or, or put the deal out to tender again and renegotiated this time with a new firm in 2015. And this was uh, actually the US subsidiary of the Dutch um, conglomerate Philips. Um, you'll know of Philips probably um, as the firm that made electric shavers and light bulbs uh, and other electronic and electrical devices. Uh, not really anymore. It's reinvented itself um, over the last decade or so as, um, as a medical device manufacturer. There's no future for it in electronics, in consumer electronics, um, but rather um, it has become a rival to Medtronic as one of the handful of global firms that uh, dominate the, the manufacture and supply of um, complex medical devices. So now Philips received the funding, $14 million from the US government, um, again, to develop um, uh, more than a decade after the, the plan had first been put forward to develop a low cost um, ventilator machine. The Food and Drug Administration of the US government finally approved um, production of the prototype that it had developed last September. And the government then proceeded to order the initial 10,000 machines that it wanted at a price of about $3,000 each. Um, Philips, it turns out, decided not to manufacture those devices for the government stockpile. Um, and instead, um, manufactured another version, um, one not for stockpiling, but um, uh, available at a price, I believe, about $12,000 for the private market. Um, it has said that it will get to the government stockpile later, hopefully by this summer. Um, too late, or largely too late for the um, pandemic. Um, the advantage of selling to the private market, the private healthcare market, rather than to the government for its stockpile is um, that the, it's a much more expensive version, even of this simple machine. Um, and it's marketed in particular to home users who are suffering from uh, sleep apnea, so, you know, so severe snoring, um, or, or, other, or, or other chronic respiratory um, afflictions and what it's designed to do is to connect those home users to the company's cloud-based um, sleep and respiratory care business. Um, in other words, for the company, Philips, the aim was to profit not just from selling the device as a one-time deal, but from the subscription to the online monitoring of breathing different difficulties to which the purchasers of the device are expected to subscribe. Um, so even though um, the development of this machine had been funded by millions of, of, public, of, of dollars of public funds, um, it has not actually been produced for the purpose for which those funds were used. Um, but rather um, uh, to produce this future revenue stream um, for the corporation. So if there's a, a shortage of ventilators in the crisis of a pandemic, um, it's not actually for want of uh, government planning, or at least that's not the main uh, cause in this case. Um, but rather, uh, the critical factor seems to have been the way in which um, public attempts to prepare for a pandemic have been derailed by a particular form, not just of companies making profits, but a particular form, a particular method by which um, uh, increasingly capitalism and capitalist business operates. Um, and I, I, I want to just draw out two features from this story and then relate them to the papers that I circulated with you. Um, uh, the, the two features from this story are that these are the stories um, not about um, uh, the building of machines per se, of fairly simple machines, but of the way in which the building of devices 
um, is shaped by arrangements for constructing what we can call monopoly rent. The, the, the much higher prices than those of market prices that can be um, acquired by having some dominant or monopolistic um, uh, position in some critical flow of payments. And um, the other point, and this is one, as I said, made by the great political economist Thorsten Veblen um, a, a century ago, the, the real importance in constructing systems of, um, of monopoly rent, of a process of what he called corporate sabotage. He was writing at a time when workers had learnt the importance of the power of sabotage. And sabotage 100 years ago, or just before the First World War, didn't, and today it, it has associations with blowing things up, um, because that's what it came to mean in the First World War. But sabotage had a, a much more specific sense um, associated with machinery when the term came into use around the, uh, the end of the 19th and, and, and the beginning of the 20th century, and particularly as a device initially in the hands of workers. It was about um, intervening in some industrial process with some small disruption to make that process um, uh, to block or, or, or create inefficiencies in that process. And it became a tool that workers could use, a slight disruption to the working of a steam engine um, uh, was a typical um, example of, 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 of sabotage in the hands of workers and became an important mode of worker organizing 100 years or so ago. Um, but Veblen took that term sabotage and said, well, actually there's another mode of sabotage. Um, that characterizes um, modern capitalism. And it's not the sabotage of the workers, it's actually the sabotage of the business owners um, uh, and managers, because business um, is interested in profit and a profit can come as much um, out of, um, uh, of, of, of sabotage as it can come out of efficiency or making new products in the specific sense that if you want to create a system of um, a, 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 an arrangement of monopoly, a system of exclusive flows of payments. It can often be as important to sabotage um, other kinds of developments, other kinds of efficiencies, um, to introduce interruptions, um, uh, disconnections, as it can be to, 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 um, uh, to say, manufacture new products. And I think the story of the ventilators um, is precisely an example of that process of corporate sabotage at work. Um, I should say that um, one could take it further. I'm, I'm, I'm going to move away from, from ventilators, but just to mention that the firm um, that bought up uh, the small device maker um, in the first round, um, uh, the firm by the name of Covidian, um, uh, that, that today is, is part of Medtronics. In those days, it was part of, of a different business conglomerate, um, Tyco International. Uh, Tyco was actually, um, it was a business conglomerate that had begun as a, simply as an investment firm, um, a firm that, um, as was the mode of, um, uh, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s, that existed simply as a, a, as a, as a fund or as a, uh, an organization with access to credit um, that operated by buying up smaller companies um, in order to create dominant or monopoly positions in specific areas of industry. Um, it began actually in the various um, security systems for the US military um, and from there moved into um, uh, fire suppression devices, sprinklers and pumps and so on, then into electrical and electronic components, um, and, um, and after that into healthcare. And again and again, it would buy up um, companies, um, uh, load them with debt, um, liquidate parts that could not be organized together into a mon more monopolistic arrangement, um, shut down competitors, engage in, in, in price gouging, um, and of course the cutting of worker pay and social protections, the raiding of social uh, pension funds, um, and in some cases with Tyco of outright fraud, um, uh, and did that as a process through the, the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s, eventually buying up more than 3,000 
um, small manufacturing companies and other businesses um, and producing extraordinary returns for uh, the investors and then when it went public, the shareholders. So I've illustrated its mode of operation in relation to um, one kind of medical device, but it was doing this across a whole range of specialist industries um, and turning itself into uh, an extraordinary large business conglomerate. And of course, like so many others, um, uh, earning its profits offshore, its headquarters were in Bermuda. And then when it spun off Covidian, Covidian moved its, 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 its um, legal headquarters to Ireland in order to pay um, the, the extremely low corporate tax rates in Ireland, even though it remained an American run company. Um, so one could extend from the case of ventilators to a larger history of um, corporate capitalism over the last 30, 40, 50 years, um, exploring those same principles of monopoly rent and of corporate sabotage at work. Um, so let me tie that story, which is very much about our condition today, to the kinds of points that I was making in the in the two papers that I circulated. Um, the argument of those papers, as you know, is that corporate capitalism's main mode of its extraction, which we often think of in terms of industry and workers or in terms of um, uh, capitalism in terms of the operation of markets, both of which indeed are, are, are parts of, of how, it, how it operates. But capitalism's main mode of extraction um, of payments and of profits is of payments from the future. Um, now, in some ways, this is something relatively new. Um, you, can, you can mark its newness in various ways. I've just talked about development since the 1980s, which is one way of talking about it. But to the extent that it's associated today, particularly with the, the large and increasingly monopolistic joint stock company, it would go back to uh, let's say the 1870s and 1880s. It's been around for let's say 150 um, years in the particular form of shareholder <coughs> capitalism. Um, but even those had a precedence. And in fact, historically over the centuries, um, these methods of extraction from the future um, had other forms. Uh, long distance trade, the colonizing corporations of the um, uh, of, of the 17th and 18th century, the, the, the East, East India Company um, uh, being the most famous, but similar colonizing corporations um, uh, across um, North America um, and um, Southern Africa, and then ultimately when they revived in the, in, in, in the, um, in the 19th century across many other parts of Africa where Colonialism took the form of is establishing a, a corporate body that had the exclusive rights to trade and to commodities from a particular territory. So while I've associated this in the papers and this story with, um, uh, with, with modern forms of corporate capitalism, I think the general argument about extraction actually applies to much longer and larger histories of colonialism. Um, and in fact, I think because of that long association with colonialism and with long distance trade and with the forms of monopoly that went with um, the colonizing corporation, um, we very much came to think of capitalism spatially um, as a system of geographic expansion, uh, geographic expansion and control. And one of the things I've suggested in these papers is um, that that kind of sort of transformation um, in our thinking about capitalism when we began to take seriously um, the history of colonialism and the spatial or geographic dimension of modes of extracting profit. Um, we actually need to transfer those methods to thinking of capitalism tempor tem temporally um, uh, as, um, as not just a system that expands across space, but as, as, a, as a very particular mode of expanding into the future. Um, it, it, it's not easy to make money from the future. It's been around again for a long time. Any money lender, um, anyone able to extend credit um, was in a sense making money from the future because the repayment always came with an addition. Um, 
uh, or at the full amount of what had been previously lent out at a discount. Um, but of course, those kinds of cycles of credit that historically existed had a limit. The limit would tend to be that of the agricultural cycle because so much of credit was associated with, um, uh, with, with, with farming and with agricultural credit. Uh, the thing about colonizing corporations is they could extend that cycle of credit, not only spatially around the world, but also in time, because a ship would go out and might not come back for a year or two years and uh, return the profit to the creditors. Um, in the last 100, 150 years, it's been able to do things far beyond the sort of time scale of a, of a ship journey or an agricultural cycle and to build um, uh, systems for capturing revenue from the future that are far more extended in time. The great example of the 19th century um, was the railroad. You suddenly had a device, an apparatus, which was going to generate a revenue, and that revenue was going to, could be projected to come in for the next 10, 20, 50 years, uh, large canals, other kinds of infrastructure projects. Um, and infrastructure, again, is a source of that revenue from the future, as I um, uh, suggested in the, the paper on infrastructure in the days of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative um, is, is, is an example of that. Um, but it's not just that you have some long-term revenue projected into the future. You've also, um, that, that you can have some sort of monopolistic claim on and that you can sabotage rivals to put them out of business. But you also need some way as the entrepreneur, as the organizer, of um, that future stream to realize it in the present. Um, there may be revenues coming in down the road from those who are going to um, uh, pay fares on the railroad to travel or to ship goods or whatever. But the point about these methods of colonizing the future is it's a way of realizing that windfall in the present, which is what I try to explore in the paper about Uber. It's not just that you can construct a relationship to the future of a monopolistic kind, but then principally through the device of the shareholder company, um, you as the entrepreneur um, realize that extraordinary future profit in the present um, and the history of shares and shareholding and how they came to be this um, extraordinary new form of property that gets invented um, a longer history, but takes on a radically new form about 100, 150 years ago when it actually represents property in its own right. It's a transformation in property owning um, as radical to the history of capitalism as, say, the, the enclosure movement um, of earlier centuries that turned land into a source of, into a system of private property. Um, shares these claims on the future as a negotiable instrument that um, can be traded and uh, realized and profited from in the present. Um, this relationship to the future then has certain kinds of technical histories. It's built with, with railroads or with um, uh, car sharing apps or with ventilators and so on. Um, one of the consequences of thinking about capitalism as the colonizing of the future is that we have to understand that um, uh, the present lives in a very particular relationship to the future. Um, the present lives in a relationship where those coming later are going to be paying the bill. Um, and um, that's the, the mode by which that happens is one of the things I've tried to lay out in these papers. The other thing I've tried to lay out in them, in them and let me just, um, uh, is why is it that we don't see this? Why is it that we've developed over the last centuries and the last 150 years, and particularly over the last generation, extraordinary ways of extracting rent, of extracting income from the lives of those who come after us? Um, and we don't understand that process for what it is. We don't understand those modes of imposing a cost now that will be repaid from those living later. Um, and to me, one of the critical arguments in the paper is the way we misrepresent 
our relationship to the future as a relationship of growth. Um, we have particular ways of conceiving of time and of historical time and above all of economic time um, that have to do with the construction of the economy as a measurable object, the calculation of GDP as the movement of that object through time and the measuring of the difference over time in terms of a process of growth. One of the arguments I've tried to develop there is that um, a particular way of constructing that conception of growth, um, that particular way of counting some numbers and not others, of, of regarding interest as a process of increasement, increasing rather than a process of discounting and reducing, all those have allowed us to um, represent and experience our path from the present to the future, even today as one of progress, as one of improvement, um, rather than one of gradual impoverishment of the future. Um, and we managed to do that even though for so many people in so many parts of the world, including and perhaps especially in um, sort of G20 industrialized countries, um, the actual relationship um, of, of the passage of time over the last generation has been one either of impoverishment or at best of sort of treading water, of standing still in an age where um, wealth has continued to accumulate on quite extraordinary um, uh, scales. Um, the other aspect uh, of, of the papers is uh, trying to think through how do we think about the question of technology? How do we approach technology um, in ways that doesn't take account, doesn't take um, its sort of cues from technology's own account of itself as constant improvement? And um, I, I discuss technology in the Uber paper as the kind of second alibi besides growth, which under capitalism um, uh, attempts to organize and, and, and explain our relationship to the future. And I think very often we are, as it were, seduced by the very sort of language and imagery of, of technology and technical um, progress um, into a particular misrepresentation and misunderstanding, first of where wealth comes from, and secondly, of the relationship to the future. Um, I, th I think the story of the um, uh, of, of the ventilator um, where uh, the attempt to produce um, a simpler a more effective and um, far more life-saving um, model of ventilator um, which doesn't fit with any easy story of capitalism as a process of technological improvement and progress um, is an illustration of our problems of way in, in ways of thinking about capitalism and technology. Um, I think the ventilator can also, um, example can also help us think of one other thing, which is that um, uh, capitalism is always looking for, as it were, new revenue streams, um, which means new ways in which to have some reliable connection to future payments. Um, and it's gone through a whole history of those. I mentioned railroads. One could talk about the history of energy, of oil and um, a, 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 a other um, large-scale energy industries. One could talk about the history of large-scale manufacturing. Um, but a problem with a lot of these is that they become um, suddenly liable at certain points to, to, to competitive pressure, having established a monopoly, having established some kind of dominant position where the future looks like a source of realizable revenue, um, something disruptive happens. You can see that with what's happening even now with the coronavirus crisis to the oil industry, um, which of course is bringing to the forefront the threat that fossil fuel industry faces from the, the arrival of um, of, of, of energy systems, renewable ones that work on very, very different financial principles. Um, so there's always a problem of where do you find um, the next revenue stream, the next sort of long lived and, and fairly sort of certain unfolding process um, that can be indebted um, in order to realize profits. Um, and curiously, um, one of those um, 
and one that's that's been written about particularly those writing about the history of debt and the turning of our own lives into i'm thinking of the work of people like lazzarato turning our own lives into these endless these these, these continuing systems of debt repayment one of those sort of long extended processes that is more and more available to capitalization is actually the human life itself um, is, is actually the very span of a life unfolding through time because it's one of those things that we as individuals and households and families and communities have a commitment to securing a, a future for and um, it's not surprising uh, from that point of view that, that these industrial conglomerates like Philips and um, uh, 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 the, the, the other um, medical um, uh, device industries, uh, Medtronics that I mentioned, um, have this extraordinary future around, um, as it were, the manufacturing of artificial forms of, of, of critical human organs. Um, because indeed that is a way in which um, there is around us um, uh, a form of um, a form of revenue, a form of payments out of which um, the future can be capitalized, uh, albeit as we are seeing right now with um, with devastating consequences for those who who needed more of those ventilators it 's nine forty five so I'll stop there. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm tempted to uh, to say something, but I'll hold myself and and uh, and recognize the uh, discussants. Uh, Tosin. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Mamdani. And also, um, I thank you, Professor. Timothy Mitchell for your, your um, our discussion and the papers. I found them very interesting. So I, I'll focus, uh, I'll center my discussion here on the paper, the two papers that we, uh, we have read. Um, and I think that uh, the principal claim um, that this uh, paper, uh, the animates this paper is that capitalism is consuming the colonizer in the future. So how, how then is capitalism colonizing the future? Uh, to explain how capitalism is colonizing the future, Professor Timothy Mitchell gives us certain conceptual categories uh, which are important to understand um, these processes. Um, uh, capitalization through which future credits are made available in the present at a discounted rate and by postponing payments to future time. And the consequence of this is that mon money multiplies over time on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, I think that um, what is for me particularly instructive here is Professor Mitchell's analytical strategy um, marked by influences from Foucault and Latour First, Professor Mitchell is formulating a problem in the present. And so here, the methodology that he gives us is one that is marked by an attempt to identify a source of discontentment in the present, uh, the fact that capitalism is con consuming the future already, uh, an attempt to bust popular taking for granted assumptions, uh, which is, um, the assumption that infrastructures are supposed to enhance communication over space, across space, and therefore enhance travel time, or economic assumptions that um, economics is about growth and capitalist expansion. And so what uh, he tries to do as a result of, uh, with this uh, uh, methodology is to unveil uh, what is actually eaten by the popular discourses on, uh, on growth or on economics and uh, uh, in the second paper on infrastructure. 
Uh, the second element, which is also instructive, is the Latourian influence. Uh, here, um, Latour, uh, um, um, Professor Mitchell, is concerned with following things rather than following social relations. So the influence is on things, uh, the, the, the emphasis is on things and not on social relations. And so that uh, what I think uh, is animates the focus on things is that by focus, focusing on things, you can therefore uh, un unravel the bundles of social relations that are assembled around those things. Uh, so in this case, uh, infrastructure and money. Uh, I will return to this very shortly. So let me make my own comments. Uh, so I think that uh, if we look very closely at these papers, uh, the big question that is raised here is the relationship of capitalism to space and time. So how is capitalism related to space and to time? I think that to answer this question, Professor Mitchell attempts to give us a recuperated conception of time. So firstly, he attempts to emancipate time from its subsidiary relationship to space. And so time is not supposed to be uh, an, uh, an effect of the attempt to bridge or establish communication between one space and another. Uh, so it seems here that the attempt here is to autonomize time, disentangle time from its relationship with space. The second thing he attempts to do is to challenge the assumption that time is about speed. It seems to be saying that time is not as such about speed, but about postponements and delays. So, infrastructural projects are not primarily concerned with establishing lines of communication between one space and another, they are supposed to commute financial instruments across time. And therefore, what financial instruments do is to pass on the burden, the burden of certain windfalls in the present to future generations. I think that what eventually emerges from this is that space, analysis of space, completely drops off the picture. Professor Mitchell tells us that the most important element of modern capitalism is not spatial expansion or the intensification of spatial connection through infrastructure. This is a relationship of capitalism to the future. And so what eventually emerges from this is a recuperated conception analysis of time without a concomitant conception of space. So therefore, what is the implication of the absence of a corresponding analysis of space on this project that Professor Mitchell is undertaking? I think the two consequences immediately come to mind. Uh, firstly, I think that without an analysis of space, Professor Mitchell takes for granted how changes in the capitalist state system and the international legal order would eventually, could consequentially um, alter the validity of financial receipts or financial instruments. In other words, would financial instruments be tenable if the state system and international legal architecture undergoes fundamental transformation? The second question is that without spatial analysis, the assumption is simply to think of the transfer of financial burdens across time. But Contemporaneously, financial obligations are being commuted between states that are contemporaneously existing. All right. 
So I think that the spatial question completely drops off the picture. And what that does is that the analysis that Professor Mitchell gives us is fundamentally methodologically nationalist because he cannot uh, address, the analysis cannot attend to uh, the, 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 the plurality or the multiplicity that characterizes the state system. Uh, I think that this uh, observation is particularly instructive when we think of how um, loans from, say, the China Exim Bank is currently used to finance the railway infrastructure and road infrastructure across Africa. Uh, what is being communicated here is not merely financial burden from the present generation to future generation, but a chain of indebtedness that now exists between one country and another country existing within a contemporaneous time. Now, let me go now to the uh, what I think is the impact of the influence of Latour on Professor Mitchell's analysis. I think here we are confronted by the thinkification of financial instruments. Uh, Professor Mitchell tells us that the analysis to understand um, infrastructure, we have to start first with the financial instruments. In other words, the means of exchange and not the purpose for which infrastructures are purposely constructed. I think that uh, the tendency to fall back on an analysis of money uh, eventually leads him to reify money. So to understand how money multiplies, we have to look at the internal logic uh, of the way in which um, processes of capitalization and delays uh, eventually if have effects on the multiplication of money. So production of money or the expansion of monetary resources is not as a result of posting higher profits or is not as a result of processes of expanded reproduction is not as a result of the exploitation of workers. I think that consequently, Professor Mitchell disembeds financial instruments from a bundle of social relations in which they are supposed to have meanings. So the charge here is a charge uh, of reification. Finally, the claim that prim the, the, the primary reasons why infrastructure are invested is to facilitate movement of financial receipts across time is interesting but contentious. I, I think that this is true to the extent that, as a constant, financial receipts are used to finance infrastructures or the development of public infrastructure. Uh, but we know that not all investments in infrastructure require transmission of financial burdens to future generations. And we also know that investments in infrastructure could also pose immediate challenge to the livelihoods of the peasantry and rural communities in the present. So the assumption that investment in infrastructure automatically leads to the commu to commuting financial burden to the future uh, needs to be thoroughly interrogated. So I would want to contend that the invest that the um, that the idea that the purpose of infrastructure, both the explicit purpose and the implicit purpose cannot be understood as an a priori claim. This must be the outcome of empirical social science studies. 
I think the two examples from investments in infrastructure in Africa from the 1950s through to the 1970s is particularly notable uh, to justify why this kind of analysis must be an empirical analysis and cannot be stated a priori. The first is the purpose for investment in infrastructure between the 1940s and 1960s. Now we all agree that at the general level, the justification for investment in infrastructure is to provide public goods. But then what are the implicit purposes? And I want to contend that these purposes are not fixed and it cannot be reduced to the claim there is an attempt that is marked by an attempt to commute financial receipts across time. So if you look at the 1940s through to the 1960s, investment in large-scale infrastructure were largely crucial to the making of a class of indigenous elites. Here, the challenge was to commute resources from investment in public spending to financing political parties and nationalist movements. In the 1970s, the implicit agenda for investments in public infrastructure was aimed at consolidating the hegemony of the national state over society through ambitious and unsustainable investment in public infrastructure. So I think that the claim that investment in public in infrastructure is primarily aimed at community financial receipts across time um, cannot be stabilized. It has to be a product of, of a contextual, thick contextual analysis. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me, Tosin? Yes, I can. Great. Um, our second discussant, uh, Teresa. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Professor uh, Timothy Mitchell. Uh, so I am picking up from where uh, Tosin has ended. Um, I am intrigued by the conceptions that Professor introduces on how capitalism consumes the future. Um, he is showing us that the idea of growth has been misconceived uh, because in the process of calculating growth, uh, the so-called growth is actually um, a way of capitalizing what he described as capitalizing the future because uh, credit is presented as a store for value and then it is uh, projected into the future. So we are able to access future credit at, at the moment. Um, so he, he gives us the two examples of Uber and the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative as uh, examples of a capitalist apparatus that uh, cap uh, that capitalism uses to consume the futures, the future. So now he shows us that companies, different capitalist companies are constructing different forms of apparatus to consume the future. And in, in one of the papers, he shows us uh, how the, the capitalist apparatus has evolved over time uh, from the colonial trade to the railway, to the banking sector, and then he, he shows us that the infrastructure and the shareholding corporation are the most effective ways that contemporary capitalism is consuming the future. So as Tosin already elaborated, he downplays the role of a, a cap capitalism consuming space and prioritizes how capitalism consumes, consumes the future. But 
if you go back to the example of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, um, you find that a professor has, has uh, prioritized the economic or the, by focusing on how capitalism consumes the future, he prioritizes the finance uh, expansion of capitalism and then blinds us to the political possibility of expansion. Of expansion. Because um, apart from speeding up the movement of goods and, and time as he shows us in the papers, there are also other China right now because of the war with the West, it's not just economic but political. What is the role of the rise of China within the Belt and, and Road uh, Initiative, but also the role of China uh, expanding in Africa. As Tosin already said, China is one of the biggest funders of infrastructural development. And already it is seen in different territories how China is increasing debt and taking up different infra infrastructures um, that were built through Chinese loans. So if we focus on, do we explain on or the political agenda of, 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 of capitalist expansion, which is attached to um, these capitalist enterprises or apparatus as, as Professor puts it. Um, so one of the reasons for the development of the Road and Belt Initiative and the infrastructural development of China into Africa is said to be China trying to find alternatives and trading alternatives within Africa in the Middle East and within Asia, finding alternatives to, to the West. So the focus on infrastructural development would contain both political, which is the space, and then time, thinking of the future. So rather than isolate or downplay how capitalism is continuing to occupy space, I would rather think that the analysis should combine how capitalism is continuing to consume more space in addition to time. Because uh, it's not only occupying the future, but it seeks to capture more space. And a second point I want to make concerns the conception of capitalism itself. And this is because a uh, professor writes of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative of China as an example of, as a, as an example of a capitalist enterprise that is being built to enable capitalism to consume the future. Um, if you read the the debates on 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 China, the reform that China has take, undertaken since the 1970s. There is no consensus about whether or not the mode of production that we see in China is capitalist or not. And, and this debate is among politicians and scholars and policy makers. So how do we arrive at defining the the, 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 the Belt and Road Initiative as a capitalist apparatus. Because from the arguments of uh, some Chinese scholars, you find that they are, they are defining the, the, the reform that China made, not as a capitalist, but as a, a socialist market economy. 
So China is interested in participating in the market, expanding its market within territories. And so I think the conception of um, whether or not, especially in relation to China, that may not be easily stabilized as, uh, as capitalism because there is still ongoing, an ongoing debate of even if it is capitalism, what is the nature of, of capitalism that, is, that we see in China? And uh, depending on the nature of capitalism or a market, a socialist market economy, does it have the same effect on then how uh, difference? The third point, I wanted to make is about capitalism in developing economies. Because Professor shows us that one of the most effective apparatus is what he calls the corporate shareholding model. Where the stock market is not fully developed, is not operating at maximum. I see that the way in which then capitalism consumes the future um, has a limitation. So there are limitations. So there are certain conditions in different economies that puts a limit to the way that capitalism consumes the future. Because if you see in an economy where the stock market is not fully developed, where the general public and where the economy is defined or is dominated by those who operate in the informal sector. You find that the biggest percentage of the population is not captured in the corporate model of capitalism. So uh, we seem to have frozen. Uh, Teresa, can you hear me? So uh, what I'm going to do is to, uh, is to send a chat message to Teresa to say that she can come in later on. And meanwhile, uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll turn to Professor Mitchell uh, to give her a response. I'm sorry we lost the last few bits of Teresa's comments, but hopefully um, she can come back to them. Uh, but I'd like to thank both her and Tolson for their very thoughtful and uh, critical engagements with these um, uh, papers. I'll, I'll try and be brief because I know in these sessions as there's, there's always so many people who want to join in and I don't need to dominate the conversation any more than I already have. Um, so let me just take up um, two or three uh, uh, of the points from their very rich um, remarks. The first uh, and, and the most obvious one to, to deal with, because actually both of them made it, is that I downplay the role of space. And I say, yes, I acknowledge that. Um, I, 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 I defend myself by saying, you know, that's a particular framing of the argument of the papers. I hope it's not, um, it's not necessarily um, a feature of of the actual analysis in the in the papers. Um, uh, I, I, I've certainly tried to bring into view and and and, and think critically in a, in a slightly different way about the construction of time, um, but um, not in a way that I hope is 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 completely. Um, uh, divorced from um, uh, uh, the very way, in fact, in, 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 in which projects and programs that um, appear to exist and, and do indeed are built uh, in, in a spatial form um, can be thought of as having equally, um, and in, in fact, in some ways, very often as their main purpose, this temporal dimension that I think is um, 
uh, uh, recedes from view because of the very spatial nature of the project. The thing about infrastructure is that it is, it is indeed um, uh, a set of largely spatially um, realized um, forms of uh, forms of encounter and engagement with the world. So, so our, our natural inclination is, is, is to treat them as spatial objects and then to the extent that they have a temporal aspect that is a consequence of the spatial, which is the way I, I, I talk about it in the paper. So if um, a, 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 a Belt and Road initiative connect spaces and as a consequence there is some temporal benefit. Um, it's not that I'm trying to devalue the space, I'm saying what if we think about that the other way around? Um, that perhaps one of the functions of this, perhaps the, the main function of many of these projects is to construct a relationship to the future which in the case of large infrastructure projects takes on a spatial form and, and, and shift the ways, the terms, the priorities in which we talk about um, the arrangements of space and time. So yes, uh, uh, one, one cannot talk about um, infrastructure these days without, and, and particularly in reference to the Belt and Road Initiative, without talking about the extraordinary expansion of, of China uh, into Africa, into the Middle East, into South Asia, and so on, through the very means of infrastructure projects. So I, I don't want to under, uh, in any way discount that. Um, uh, or, um, indeed um, uh, uh, other spatial aspects of, of, of finance. And so, you know, I thank you for maybe drawing my attention to the fact that, that in my sort of obsession with thinking about the temporal, I might have um, uh, really downplayed the way in which um, these are equally um, things that have to be realized in spatial terms. Um, uh, there's the question about capitalism. What is capitalism? This was one of Teresa's questions. Um, what is capitalism when, when we're talking about China, for example? Um, uh, obviously, some of, the, some of the examples, the one today about medical devices and the one about Uber, I, I, I tend to be um, rather US and European centric ones. The infrastructure one does, uh, does make reference to some, some of the Chinese examples. Um, there's no consensus on, on whether China is capitalist. I agree, um, but my answer to this, I actually really hesitated to use the word capitalism in the title of this and in the talks, because I think it gets in our way. Um, uh, I, I think um, on the whole, capitalism is, is, is just too general and too abstract a term to help us make sense of, um, uh, of, of, of what is um, happening. And, um, I think that's going to be even more the case going forward um, as the world and particularly the, the sort of G20 countries recover from and rebuild themselves from this moment of crisis brought on by the coronavirus. I, I, you know, it, the comparisons are being made to the 1930s. One of the interesting things, if you go back to um, accounts of key economists and political economists of, of, of writing at the end of the 1930s, I'm thinking of the work of um, Karl Polanyi in The Great Transformation, of, of uh, Joseph Schumpeter in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. One thing they were all um, sure on is that capitalism, whatever it had been, it had finished. The world we were moving into after the, 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 the financial crisis of 1929 and the Great Depression in the 1930s, whatever we were moving into, it was not capitalism. Uh, it was some other kind of mixture of socialism, social market, roles of states, um, collapse of empires. Capitalism was that past uh, arrangement of laissez-faire and imperialism and so on. Um, but of course, you know, with the emergence of the Cold War, it became convenient to construct a rigid distinction between socialism and capitalism. And so the word capitalism came back in as a shorthand to describe something that was fundamentally different from what had gone before. And I'm sure we'll do the same thing again. Worlds will get rebuilt um, in fundamentally new ways. And um, uh, this word capitalism will continue to be used despite the transformations and the differences. So I think it's really important to, indeed to, to think seriously about the differences um, that, that the Chinese model represents, um, but not as a sort of definition of is it capitalism or not, but rather just to, to, to be aware of it. Um, 
Uh, and then there's, there were two points by both Tosin and Teresa that um, were more particularly about cap, uh, capitalism and, and about these questions in relation to developing countries. Tosin's one about um, infrastructure being um, not so much a mode of capturing the future, particularly in the in the sort of post-independence period and the um, uh, 60s and 70s, um, but a mode of national elites constructing their own power. Um, and then um, uh, Teresa's point, that, um, a more contemporary one, that um, uh, what about countries that actually are not dominated by forms of shareholder capitalism and stock markets, but by the informal sector? And I think those are both really important points, and I uh, uh, apologize that these papers didn't at least acknowledge the significance of, of both those questions. Very briefly on each of them, um, yes, uh, these, um, these, these giant infrastructure projects were indeed that, the, the one I'm most familiar with and I've written about is, uh, is that of the Nasser regime in Egypt um, in, in the 1950s and 60s in the building of the Aswan Dam. Um, and it's a very interesting case, of course, because initially that was to be funded by Wall Street. Um, uh, it was to be funded actually by the World Bank, but the World Bank didn't have its own funds. It was a conduit for Wall Street investment. And Wall Street was very keen on dams because they're so big that they're sort of reliable and you can invest into countries um, of the South without the kind of risks that you might have if you were trying to invest in real estate or business or manufacturing or something. So there's a very sort of interesting history of that interplay between a, a form of financial and corporate capitalism represented by uh, Wall Street and, and, and its sort of agency, the World Bank, um, and the state building project of something like the Nasser regime. And of course, they do clash. Um, I wrote a paper about that called Econometality, which um, I've tried to think through some of those, and it's going to be part of, of this book. Um, so I will try and do better to, to take that on, but I, I agree completely um, on that one. But to think about the intersection and clashing of those rival projects where um, the, in, in, in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and so on, is I think I agree with Tosin enormously important. I, I'd say something similar about the informal sector. Um, again, there's gonna be a chapter in the book that takes this on. And again, it's, it's based on a couple of papers I've already written. One of them is called The Work of Economics. Um, all these are on my website and I'd be very keen to have people take a look. Um, the work of economics focuses on um, the work of this uh, well-known Peruvian development guru, Anando de Soto, who has precisely tried to do what I'm talking about to the informal sector. Um, and I believe he's been active in East, and in East Africa at various moments, as in Egypt, as in um, Peru, where he started. And um, it was taken up by the World Bank of this guru of how to develop economies that were dominated by the informal sector. And his answer is in effect, capitalization. His answer is the problem of global poverty will go away if you just enable the poor who, 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 who live in relation to uh, and through the informal sector, if you enable them to, in very simple ways, formalize that because once it is formalized through property titling in De Soto's work, what you will have is um, a mode in which the poor can access credit um, by then mortgaging the properties to which um, they have title. And his books, which became bestsellers in the West, but he was also taken up uh, very enthusiastically by governments around the world, are about how do we organize in the absence of a stock market um, a system, systems of credit and capitalization so that um, developing countries can benefit from these same modes of credit creation that have been um, part of the West. Um, so I agree that those are enormously important considerations and I hope other parts of the book um, uh, will, will address them. Um, and, and I'm certainly well aware that um, the particular modes of corporate capitalism um, uh, that are the focus of, of the talk today and of, um, uh, uh, of uh, particularly the, the Uber um, paper um, ha have a very specific uh, geographic uh, referent, um, reference. I, I do think that's still important work to be done simply because of the continuing role of um, Western economists and 
um, economics as of this um, uh, Western-centered form of knowledge in, 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 in laying down the ways we should think about um, problems of development. And, um, you know, it's extraordinary to think that even today, um, uh, writing on development, even though it's, it's moved away from the sort of classic approaches of, of the 60s and 70s, where it was always about, you know, saving and capital formation and taking money out of rural sectors and putting them into urban sectors. And so those are, those are answers to um, some of the main points. I haven't done justice to, uh, to everything um, that we've, uh, we've covered um, in, in those very rich remarks. But as I say, I do want to let other people into the conversation. So what I'm suggesting is a, is a short break, a five minute break. Uh, people can uh, recollect their thoughts and uh, please uh, put down your name and institutional affiliation on uh, on chat and then I will I will uh, recognize people one by one and then you can uh, articulate your own question and after maybe three four questions Professor Mitchell can respond and then we can go into a second cycle of questions um, I hope that's Fine, just put your thumb up if you have heard me. Yeah, great, thank you. Can you hear me? I should be unmuted now. Okay, I can now hear you and can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, let me take advantage of my position as chair here or at least as the unmuted one, uh, to, uh, to make an observation um, on this, on the presentation and the two discussions. Uh, I found it, uh, I find the, uh, the uh, uh, perspectives uh, of the speaker and the two discussants um, the difference in perspective is quite interesting. Uh, it evokes for me the literature on capitalism and the literature on imperialism. Uh, if I think back of Marx and, and capital, uh, it is to me much more about the temporal dimension of capitalism. Uh, commodity, money, commodity, and then money, commodity, money. Um, as opposed to Rosa Luxemburg on the realization question, uh, which is much more about the special dimension of, of, of capitalism. Um, and generally, I think the literature on imperialism is far more focused on the special dimension than the literature on capitalism. Um, and it's interesting that Professor Mitchell's essay is called Capitalism as a Mode of Colonizing the Future, not Imperialism as a Mode of Colonizing the Future. So the critique from the two discussants is really focusing on, as, as I hear it, what about imperialism? Uh, what about uh, places which cannot simply and unproblematically be described as capitalist. It takes us back to the old debate on articulation of modes of production, uh, capitalist production as opposed to capitalist accumulation on a global scale. Um, debate since dependence, dependency theory, which, which, were, which have been driving, driving the literature. So I say this just as, a, just as a comment and as somebody who is very interested in seeing how this debate and discussion develops and how Professor Mitchell brings together the literature on imperialism, the literature on capitalism, the two together uh, in, a, in a book that we will very much look forward to. Um, I am of course very struck by the fact that uh, uh, Professor Mitchell in his presentation uh, directs our attention not to a kind of a positivistic reading of capitalism, but to how capitalism represents itself. Why is 
why is it that we have missed this? Uh, because we've, we've bought a particular spin on capitalism. Uh, and 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 this is this is a twist also I think, uh, and a very interesting one. So let me go to, let me go to uh, recognize um, the first person is uh, Adventino Banjua. Now let me see. Do I? How do I do this? Do I unmute everybody? I think I'm going to unmute everybody, rather than looking for each person. Great. Okay, the first person to be unmuted is that baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Adventino, please go ahead. Um, minutes, thank you, right? Prof. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Prof. And thank you, Professor Mitchell, for the uh, presentation and for the papers. I had posted the question, but I think let me repeat it. So, my question is on how you think about the question of agency. In, in this formulation of capitalism. So what are the forces, what are the counter forces against this colonization of the future? Um, so, so yeah, it's a question on agency and how you're thinking about it as you're writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think Jacob Katumusime, Jacob. Yes. Um, Can you hear also, me? I also posted the question, and uh, maybe I can also repeat it, but I want to say thank you, Professor Mitchell, um, and I also think, uh, thank you, Professor Mamdani, for organizing this. So my question is on the uh, conceptual implications of that notion of uh, colonizing time, because uh, it, Capitalism is here presented, uh, uh, this capitalism, this colonizing of time is another strand is of, 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 colon of this capitalism is another strand of colonialism. So I'm thinking about who can, who can be a part of this uh, colonial, colonial, new strand of colonial project, who can be, because we see these companies, Uber, um, and we have many here, you know, so the formerly colonized countries, we have many of such companies coming up every day and they are owned by people here. So who can be part of this and who cannot be part of this? And where would, what would their, their experts of colonialism extend to? Where would, what would be its limits? And then also... Uh, one, question question at, one question at a time. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bezabe. Um, thank you very much. I have two questions. Um, shall I ask two questions or one question? Um, the, the two questions are related anyway. So thank you, for, uh, Professor Mitchell, for, um, for your interesting discussion. Um, my question relates um, with the way you have analyzed uh, the interaction between the, the future and, and capital. You seems to connect the future with corporate capitalism. Um, this is interesting, <coughs> but my worry is that wouldn't this amount to stealing the future from the others by giving a monolithic explanations of how the features intersect and is monopolized by people? Um, in other words, shouldn't we understand the future as being multiple? and capitalist trees in the world multiple as well. Even if we, if we say that uh, capital has a single story around the world, doesn't capital has centrality, does capital has centrality in civil societies and cultures in terms of conceptualizing the future? Um, for me, there is something unsettling in this attempt of connecting the future with cor cor corporate capital. Only I suspect that is not understand capital in other societies, but because capital itself is in uh, other cultures and societies. Uh, my second question has to, uh, has to do with the object of your an analysis, which is the ventilator. Oh, oh, we can't hear you. You can't hear me now? Now we can hear you, yeah. 
So my second question has to uh, do with the object of analysis of uh, Professor Mitchell. Um, from my perspective, the ventilators as a central of object of analysis become only central because it's, it is seen from a perspective that is deeply Western. What are the objects that take centrality in a situation where there is no ventilation machine? In dealing with the future and capital, we also need to, I think, to diversify and incorporate other objects which become important in other spaces and other cultures outside North America and Europe. In the case of my country, for example, Ethiopia, where there are um, only 53 ventilators, there are other objects which become more relevant, uh, and such as incense and holy water. The ventilator hegemonic uh, position is deeply cultural if one can see it from the other culture. At least this is my suspicion. We have, for example, cases of Ethiopian priests fumigating Washington, D.C., and Minnesota in the world of coronavirus. So even, even for Ethiopians in North America, what is important as an object is not the ventilator, but the incense, um, which, 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 which becomes um, central. Um, short, so in short, my, my, my worry is that we need to have a diverse, diverse, diversified history of objects that becomes important in understanding about the future and capitalism. But we also need to disassociate the future from capitalism because if we say that, if we, if we link um, capitalism with the future, it might amount to stealing the future's conceptions of other people we make because we make capital central. Uh, so, Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Tim, can we, can we have a response from you before we go to round two? I'll, I'll, again, I'll try and be quick. Um, there's, there's really two questions about agency in different ways from Adventino and Jacob. And um, uh, two questions um, really about the sort of Western-centered nature of the analysis from Professor Bezabe and also from you, Mahmoud, in a way. Um, maybe, maybe I'll begin with this, with, with the, the, the question, um, uh, the questions of Professor Bazavi and um, Mamdani, and um, then turn to the agency questions. Um, I, I, I completely agree that sort of fr framing the coronavirus story in relation to ventilators um, uh, is one that is deeply um, uh, located in a particular set of places, a set of hospitals in, in, in the, the, the US and um, uh, certain other places. And um, I, I think that's very important to be reminded of. Um, I, I think it matters for our thinking about this because um, there are many different ways, as you point out with the example of incest, um, in, in which one can respond to crises um, and in which one can um, uh, a, a attempt to deal with threats to public health and so on. Um, <clears throat> the point is for the kind of analysis I'm trying to do here is which of these become available to capitalization. Um, and today in, in the places I was thinking about, it happens particularly to be a story of ventilators. Of course, it used to be a story of incense. Um, because part of the early history of capitalization of these modes of um, uh, reorganizing space and time in order to profit from delay, you know, it began as the spice trade, um, it, so called. Um, it began in European attempts to um, take over from other regional trade networks the control of the movement of, of medicines from uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia to Europe. Um, it's called the spice trade and people think of pepper and, and spices used for cooking, but essentially that was a trade in medical products. And um, uh, incense would have been one of them and there would have been many other um, uh, key, um, key substances um, precisely because of the um, uh, 
the, uh, their, their availability only in some parts of the world, the ability to monopolize trade in them because of the distance they were away, you could then capitalize this trade and learn, earn extraordinary profits. As you've probably heard, um, uh, uh, President Trump is, is very keen on a synthetic form of quinine as the cure for the coronavirus and the trade in quinine and the quinjona. Uh, tree bark and the plantations of in, 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 in Southeast Asia created um, to grow that is another e example of the sort of history of dependence on certain kinds of um, uh, commodities. I, 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 I sort of don't make apologies for the focus on the ventilator, um, but, I, but I, I, I do think we precisely need this focus on objects and their histories and the ways in which, for the purpose of thinking about this, this question of our relationship to the future, some at different times lend themselves to forms of capitalization and others do not. Uh, the, the only way point I differ with Professor Bazaby on is, um, is not necessarily resorting to the word culture to explain that because, not because uh, uh, these aren't in, in some sense, um, uh, culturally important, but because of the way culture functions as the kind of opposite of the economic. Um, and, uh, or, or to stand for the local versus the global, um, the economic being what is global. Um, so, uh, you know, it, I'm not gonna sort of say we shouldn't use certain words, but I, I do think we should, um, in our interest in objects, we should not necessarily assume that some that that their appeal is is to be explained by something else called uh, called culture rather than say their usefulness um, uh, in in multiple ways. Um, so uh, then um, uh, that connects to these questions about um, uh, to what extent am I suggesting that. Uh, when we think about capitalism, we should think of it as corporate capitalism, which comes back to Mahmoud's point about the, the capitalism of Marx versus the, the imperialism of, of Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, um, uh, I'm interested in these papers in um, a certain mode of capturing the future, which I think the shareholder corporation epitomizes in a particularly strong way. But I absolutely take the point from several of you that this is not the only form and in many parts of the world, it is not the dominant form. I've already mentioned um, the prevalence of schemes of property titling and turning either turning informal into formal or with forms of microcredit and microlending, um, actually trying to or organize what is informal or what is not organized on a corporate basis as uh, a, a source of, of capitalization, as a source of um, uh, uh, ac acquisition of gains from the future. So I absolutely uh, uh, accept these points. Corporate capitalism is one particular and actually probably passing um, uh, form uh, because even the word corporate tends to refer to a particular or people have in mind a certain <laughs> large sort of industrial corporation which is not actually what dominates these processes. I talked about the medical device firm that didn't begin as a manufacturer of anything. It began as an investment firm buying up um, things. So even, even what is corporate is multiple um, in, in all kinds of ways. Um, so I, I think those are very important correctives um, to perhaps the, the, the more specific focus of some of these papers. Um, as is uh, Mahmoud tracing this back to the old um, debate between uh, Marx and the literature on capitalism versus Rosa Luxemburg and others in the literature on imperialism. Um, uh, I mean, partly that relates to this sort of history of the very term capitalism, because of course Marx didn't use the word capitalism. And when um, Lenin came to use it, he, um, he came to describe it as that which existed in the past. Imperialism was the highest form of capitalism in the sense it is the thing that had replaced the capitalism that Marx had written about. Um, and I think it, it's, it's useful to um, use, go back to that kind of literature, partly to, to know that it doesn't actually, um, use a, a, a lot of the um, sort of general categories that we now um, ascribe to it. 
on the particular point that that Marx was a sort of temporal analysis, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, there's a there's a very detailed analysis of time in Marx, um, uh, of course, centered in, in volume one in Capital on the, on the time of the working day and the way in which the control and the reorganizing of time um, is, is absolutely central to um, the process of capital accumulation. Um, it, it is precisely through that control of temporal processes that capital is realized. Um, by the time he, he was doing the writing that was pulled together as volume three of capital, um, he realized there was this whole other story of capitalization um, of, of the corporate form, which he referred to as the abolition of the capitalist mode of production. Um, so there's enormous amounts to be, to be gained from going back, I think, to rereading those debates um, uh, and, and, and drawing on both, while also understanding that we've been through many revolutions since then in the way in which these processes of accumulation work. Then to come to the, quickly to the questions about agency, uh, who can do this colonizing of time was Jacob's question and what, uh, what else can be done? What are the, what are the counter forces? Um, uh, again, I've been focusing on a particular story, Chinese, vast Chinese financing of, of infrastructure and American corporate capitalism, but not in order to suggest that those are the only um, agents of this. Indeed, um, uh, there, there are, uh, there are many possibilities to set up these kinds of um, uh, systems of rent and monopoly and control um, besides the ones I've mentioned. So uh, I, I, I don't in any way want to sort of see this as a handful of giant corporations in control of every possibility of our futures. Rather the opposite, that I think if, if we're going to um, uh, have some success in um, in combating the very real power that those kinds of forces have. One has to understand better how they work and what their vulnerabilities are. Um, and um, that's part of what motivated me to, to start thinking about corporations, not because I want to study American capitalism, but because on a more global level, if we don't understand it better, um, it, it, it'll be harder to confront not only it, but also to confront the, the form of economic expertise that comes um, uh, 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 along with it. Um, uh, so the counter forces um, that um, Adventino asked about, um, I referred to that earlier history of sabotage. And I think one of the things um, that one can gain from a better understanding of this peculiar mode of uh, relationship to the future in its many forms, corporate and others, is the opening up of possibilities for political agency and economic agency um, that counter that, that take it on or that take it over for, for public um, benefit and so on. Um, so I, um, you know, my, my aim in this is, is simply to, to, to un unfold understandings of, um, uh, of certain processes at work um, that, that I think we, we tend not to necessarily have sufficient tools for thinking about. I'll stop there. Thank you, Tim. Um, we have a set of questions on, on, on chat, if you have time for a, for the last round of questions, Tim. Yep. Um, there's a question from uh, Conrad Masabo at the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, and he asks, is there a way we can explain and appreciate development growth without resorting to the future? Okay, that's basically his core question. Um, uh, Mary Muhuruzi uh, from uh, Miser. Mary would like to ask a question. Mary, go ahead, please. We'll go back to Mary when Mary comes back to us. David Muinga, Miser. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the presentation and also uh, the online seminar as well. My question is in relation to how, how do you understand or conceptualize the, the, the dynamism of, of, of the future? Because it would seem there's, there's, there's a reading of an in inevitability in terms of 
of what the future is going to 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 look like based on 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 on, on the present. So in 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 other words, it would actually seem like your your conceptualization of the future is 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 is. is is, 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 is driven from, from, from the present itself. So what then is the difference between, between the two of them? And, and, and how then can we also think about the, the dynamics of, 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 of capitalism, in, of corporate capitalism in the future, different from how uh, we perceive it today? Because it seems there's a tendency to read that, uh, that the, the future, the future kind of corporate capitalism, similar to how it's being perceived in 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 in, in contemporary society today. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Diana Kamara from Miser. <laughs> thank you. I would like to say that, for the most part, I agree with Professor Mitchell that. I think, yes, he focus on uh, America, but for us, it's to take the question further. So uh, like Professor Bezabe said, maybe there are many objects, but if, but we should also remember the project of imperialism and capitalism uh, conjoined with the issues of desire. So if they had a ventilator, if they had ventilators in Ethiopia and they were enough, people would not use incense, they would call it superstition, they would call it witchcraft, but if what, if uh, if if those who are uh, I don't know if incense, for instance, is produced in Ethiopia, so if it becomes a mode of maybe uh, if it becomes a means of fighting coronavirus, the capitalist is more likely to invest in producing more incense or hiking the prices. So it might not be in corporate America, but even in our small informal economies. People find ways of, you know, taking the chance. So I think the most important part of this discussion is us looking at the modes of, uh, not okay, of, of course, corporates taking over, but also in the former economy, like here in Tanzania, everyone started buying and hiking the prices of baskets, just because we are told to wash hands. But the other side is, do we produce everything that we need to fight this virus? other than the people who hiked up the prices. No, so we hang on to all these other things because we don't have the, the ability to invest maybe in buying the ventilator. But the day we have that ability, we will desire the ventilator and forget the eucalyptus, all these other things that people are using as alternatives now because culturally, that is what, we cannot call them cultural, it's what we can afford in the capitalist system. But the day we, we afford the ventilator, we are off with the ventilator. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, Tim, that, uh, uh, that is three questions for you, if you can hear me. Thank you. Um, thank you again for the, the three um, questions. Uh, Conrad's one about um, how do we think about development or growth um, without resorting to or being trapped by, I guess, a, a, a certain conception of, of the future. Um, I, I think that's enormously important. Um, and again, I think it's, it's important to understand how, um, you know, the, the extraordinary way in which um, throughout the whole history of development as a mode of thinking about um, uh, problems of the world, and particularly of the world outside the West, um, uh, that, that there's been this extraordinary sort of both misunderstanding, and there've been many critiques of this, of the process by which um, countries in the West uh, achieved the kind of economic domination they did, and that's a, a well-known story. Um, but also the way in which um, the very conception of growth itself, development or growth, um, uh, has been misconstrued and misrepresented. It's been, so, so there's been both the misrepresenting of the particular way Britain or America or other um, imperial powers constructed their own success and their own wealth and then presented a model to other countries that bore no resemblance to the way they themselves had done things. Um, you know, they presented a, 
a, a model of, of, of savings and of belt tightening both back in the early days of development and again in, in periods of austerity, um, while they themselves um, had this entirely other way of, of credit creation and capital creation, um, which they didn't understand and didn't see as part of the history of development. So um, the, the, I think there's another whole sort of round of critical work on development that still needs to be done, that um, not the old one, of, uh, but, but one that is, is, is aware in this new way of um, what is hiding within these concepts of, of growth and of the economy of, as this object of, that grows. Um, uh, how do we do it without resorting to um, uh, the future? Um, well, I think the first thing we have to do is understand the ways in which through systems, whether it is of corporate organization or of capitalization through systems of credit, um, uh, through forms of infrastructure development and so on, the way in which we have a particular mode already of impoverishing the future. Um, and becoming more aware of that means one can then um, uh, think about or analyze any kind of, uh, of, of project or proposal with that more critical understanding in mind. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so it's, it's not so much without resorting to the future, it's without resourcing or, or, or being sufficiently critical and aware of the way in which the future has functioned um, under models of, um, uh, of, of growth and development that have tended to dominate our thinking, um, both classically and even today. Um, <clears throat> David asked about um, a, a, another question about the future, which is ab about the dynamism of the future um, versus the sense of its inevitability, which um, is perhaps uh, um, uh, the way it's um, sort of seen. Um, I, I, I don't want my own account of this sort of um, mobilization of future profits as being associated with a notion of inevitability. Um, I, I think it can be associated with an attempt to control the direction of the future, and the, the Uber story illustrates that very well, um, and as it were to uh, reduce the degree of unpredictability and uh, alternative directions that, and, and to channel the future in ways that will um, lead to the greater profitability of that particular uh, venture, whether corporate or otherwise. Um, now, uh, I, I don't think inevitability is quite the word because that future, that that future um, that is being capitalized, has to be constructed through certain methods of control, the share and shareholding and the corporation, but also legal arrangements, financial arrangements, systems of finance, systems of debt, systems of interest. All those things have to be put in place, put in place politically as much as financially and in terms of um, uh, uh, um, in, in terms of corporate or other economic structure. So I, I wouldn't contrast inevitability with dynamism, but rather competing projects of the con attempting to control um, future revenue. However, one of the important things is that once you've devised a system of, of, of either credit or shareholding that does indeed capitalize um, future earnings, then one of the things you can do is, um, of course, you can sell on that claim on future earnings, sell on that share, sell on that financial instrument um, to others, and one can organize and create markets in financial instruments of every kind. Um, but then having done that, once you've made these relationships to the future liquid, and I happen to be looking at a picture of Bob Meiser while I'm talking, who is the one person who has um, written very uh, important, interesting things um, uh, uh, about this. Um, once you've set up that one relationship to the future, which is, is based on financializing a certain future profit, and once you've made that liquid, made it something that is traded in markets, um, financial markets, stock markets, and so on, then you can set up another relationship because people will buy that um, future claim 
uh, the sellers will realize their windfall and, and go off and do other things. But the people who buy it have two different relations to the future. One set of buyers do want that inevitability. They're buying it because they indeed want that future revenue that they've just purchased a claim on. But the other set of buyers are the speculators. The people, because precisely because that future is not inevitable, precisely because it is dynamic and subject to unexpected forces, speculators come in and play a different role, the role of making, of devising ways to make money out of the collapse of that future or the crisis of that future, as much as out of the, um, the, the, the expectation it'll unfold as planned. So you end up with a system of finance uh, uh, and economics um, that sort of works in, in, in two modes. One, one mode of those who want the steady gain from the future, and the other is precisely set up to, um, to profit from what is not inevitable, what is not predictable, what, is, um, uh, what brings crisis and the unexpected. So uh, um, there's many ways in which, um, in answer to David's question, this is not simply about a sort of the inevitability of a certain course of the future. Um, and then Diana's um, point about, um, uh, again, coming back to the ventilators and um, incense, uh, and that, uh, I, I mean, I've read that partly uh, as a warning, again, not to invest too much um, uh, in the notion of culture, and she introduced the term desire, related desire to income, um, and so on. And I, I'd, I'd agree very much with that. Um, uh, uh, of course, those things like desire are part of the organizing of this future because um, if you're going to construct a future around um, uh, devices, um, uh, equipment, um, lifestyles, um, that you want to be a reliable stream of income, one of the things you've got to organize is not only stock markets or, or, or consumer markets, you've actually got to construct an organized desire. Um, and that can be harder to do. And, and of course, there are rival sources of desire and rival projects attempting to construct um, uh, alternative objects of desire. And I think perhaps desire is, is, is a better word than a more general term like culture to, to think about um, those dynamics. Um, you know, after I, 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 I'd spent a, two or three days reading an awful lot on ventilators, and um, the last thing I read, um, or actually watched because it was a short thing on YouTube, was by a doctor, an emergency room um, physician here in New York, um, who has been, who set up a, one of the special boards to treat coronavirus patients and um, was going online on YouTube to appeal to um, fellow physicians around the world because he had become concerned that ventilators were killing people. Um, he uh, suggested on the basis of what he's seen over the last two, three weeks of treating patient after patient that actually ventilators um, while a critical piece of equipment um, have led people to treat the coronavirus as if it were um, a, a serious form of flu, as if people were, uh, like as in flu, um, developing a certain kind of breathing difficulty that um, is associated with pneumonia, with um, a, a thickening of the lung and inability of the patient to use the lung and therefore you hook them up to ventilators in a particular kind of way, you focus on, on the pressure of the air going in. Um, uh, and he had come to the conclusion just from watching patients on his ward that that's not what coronavirus um, patients were suffering from. He said it seemed to be much more like not a pneumonia, but a sort of altitude sickness or something of that sort. It was about not the ability of the lungs to work, but the ability of, of, of the uh, 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 of somehow of, of oxygen to get into the blood system. And um, he was desperately appealing, not the laboratory um, specialist, but the, the, the clinic to, uh, to, to, to pay attention to the actual symptoms they were seeing and the actual way in which this machine was working or not working with particular um, um, patients.
So I, you know, I'll end with that point just because um, uh, precisely the 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 the, the, um, the way in which a particular machine or a particular object comes to seem like the answer to our future and um, both the forms of desire and lack and profit uh, wrapped up in it are always um, uh, complex questions to, to be to be to be explored and. Uh, uh, I thank you very much for helping me um, think through and, uh, and, and, and uh, take, take to heart the ways I need to expand and reframe several aspects of this project. Well, thank you. Um, on behalf of uh, all of us at Miser and your diversified audience here, uh, I want to thank you, Professor Mitchell, for really taking time out at a very difficult period, uh, at a period when the, the demands on uh, you are, like on many of us, are multiplying. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I'm aware that you're going into teaching now. Yes, that's right. So, uh, so, so double thanks. Um, my thank apologies. You. I'll, 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 I'll say my goodbyes. I, I do now have to open a new no, Zoom session no. and, and teach my class. And, but uh, I, I've really enjoyed the discussion and I'm really grateful to you all for taking the time to be here. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. I'll be in touch. I'll be in okay. touch. Thank Meanwhile, you. please uh, stay online. Bye-bye. Uh, my apologies to, to, there are still a number of you who have questions uh, unanswered, but we ran out of time. Also, a number of you, uh, uh, Professor Garabuzi uh, included, uh, have commented that the, uh, the connection has been unstable. Uh, and uh, I think Javi, we, we should we need to look into this to see whether it has to do with the local factors or global factors, uh, the, the technology as a whole, or, or the particular modem that people are using. Um, next week, uh, uh, we have kind of a continuation of political economy. Uh, Professor Robert Meister, who uh, Tim referred to and uh, uh, who is the author of a forthcoming book, will also be giving you, I think you can see him on the screen now. He, he will also be giving a, a, a talk in the coming weeks. We have to fix the date, uh, but we have agreed on, on on the fact that he will be giving a talk, um, and he'll be he'll be giving a talk on a very related topic. I leave it to him to formulate it, uh, uh, you know, and and we will advertise this. Um, so, as I said earlier on, uh, uh, this is the learning experience. Uh, uh, please send us comments on how you think we can improve this, uh, and Javi and I will will take this into consideration and hopefully make for a, 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 a more uh, a adequate uh, experience next time. I'm in New York City and it's morning here. Mo most of you, uh, those of you in California, it's early morning there. Those of you in South Africa and Kampala, it's late afternoon. So all the best. Have a great rest of the day and see you next week. Bye.